Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'm Pastor Tim Westermeyer, Senior Pastor here at St. Philip the Deacon. And uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you here tonight as we kick off the 22nd uh, annual Faith and Life series. Uh, so thank you for being with us. One of the things I like to ask as we begin these evenings is, has, is anyone here for the first time for a Faith and Life event? Awesome, wonderful. Special welcome to all of you. Uh, I know we have a lot of people joining us online as well, um, so special welcome to each of you. Um, so as I say, for 22 years we've been doing uh, these events, and I'll, I'll give you just a little context and then explain what's going to happen tonight. So over the last uh, two decades we have invited authors and executives and doctors and historians and scientists and artists uh, and bloggers, very few theologians, interestingly, mostly it's lay people, um, and they come to talk about how faith, Christian faith intersects with their daily life. Um, we have had a few uh, musicians, I'll get to that in a second, but I, I do wanna, some of you may have been here at the conclusion of last year's uh, season when we had someone named Coach Kevin O'Connell. Was anyone here for that? Okay, fair number of you. I'm not, I'm not saying, uh, what is it, correlation does not equal causation, but <laughs> the Vikings are doing pretty well this year. And if I'm not mistaken, Coach O'Connell is up for Coach of the Year, so. The Faith in Life series acts again. Anyway, um, we have had a couple of other musicians. I was actually just chatting with our speaker tonight about this. In the two decades of our uh, series, uh, we have had uh, Billy McLaughlin, who's a very famous uh, a guitarist from this area. We also had a gentleman named Steve Gould, who was a drummer for, among other artists, Sarah Bareilles. Um, so we have had some musicians, never until tonight have we had a pianist, and she's going to play a little bit, but mostly she's going to talk, which is something we were chatting about this as well, um, that she doesn't do a lot of. So I'm delighted that this platform, this forum, can give her a chance to do something uh, that she doesn't typically do. Uh, I will also say it has been a joy to work with her and her husband, Tim, uh, as we've planned for this evening. So thank you both for uh, the joy of, of preparing for tonight. Uh, our speaker tonight, um, the most, she shared a few things with me. The most famous person she initially invited into her house to both perform for and cook for was Jessie Ventura. <laughs> I don't know if she'll talk about that or not. She also played at the memorial services for Kirby Puckett, for Congressman Jim Rams Ramstead, and Prince. Um, she was inducted into the Minnesota Music Hall of Fame, so that means she's al alongside people like Bob Dylan and Judy Garland and Prince. Um, and, as you may have noticed, I introduced her husband a little earlier. His name is Tim. So she has a special fondness for people with the name Tim. <laughs> Will you join me in welcoming Lori Lai?
good evening, everybody. All right, I want everybody to say to me, when I say good evening, I want you to say, good evening, Lori Line. Here we go. Good evening, everybody. How's everybody tonight? Welcome to the Faith and Surrender series. I'm on Faith and Surrender tonight, the Faith and Life series. So fun to be here tonight. Now, the first song I played was called I Surrender All. Anybody hear it before? <laughs> Old traditional hymn. This one is called When We All Get to Heaven. What a day of rejoicing it will be. That's the goal, right? When we all get to heaven. So when you get there, come find me. I'll be at the piano. <laughs> to hear everybody when they come in and talk about Lori Line and how they found Lori Line, how I was discovered, and how so many people, I've been here for so long, but a lot of people have different stories of how they first discovered me. A lot of people found me on Pandora first. Anybody out here find me first on Pandora? Some people saw me first on PBS. I've had three PBS specials over the years. Some people first discovered me by reading Noah Adams' All Things Considered, Piano Lessons. I'm in that book. Some people first discovered me at Dayton's. <laughs> and three million people first discovered me in a Czech cereal box. <laughs> yes, I was the rice queen, everybody. And uh, three million boxes of cereal were sold. They did a promotion, and they put a CD at Christmas time of different artists. And uh, I, was the, I was the rice person. And they put my CD in a cereal box, and three million boxes of cereal were sold. And you cannot believe how many people first found me in that Czech cereal box. <laughs> but I was first discovered by my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Strew. And the story goes like this. She'd get up and she'd play the piano. And we'd all sit around the piano and sing. 
And then everybody would get out and they'd go to recess and they'd play at recess. But not me, I'd get up on the piano and I'd play the song that she played. And she noticed it, of course, and she called up my parents and said, you have to get Lori a piano. Now, when I was five years old and in kindergarten, my mother was 25 years old, a very young mother. So can you imagine the kindergarten teacher calling up a 25-year-old mother and saying, you've got to buy your daughter a piano. But she told them that I, what I was doing in the classroom, and she said, now we have to get her a piano so that she'll go out and she'll play at recess because she needs social playground skills. <laughs> and she is not going to go out and play unless we make a deal. So my parents saved and saved and saved. And on my sixth birthday, they bought me a piano. Now I remember it coming, I sat on the curb and waited for the truck to come. Because it was such a big expense for my parents, I'm one of five children, it was such a big expense, they made me promise that I would play the piano until I was 18 years old. <laughs> I have far exceeded their expectations. <laughs> now, to my dad's very dying day, which was this year, he said that the $800 that he invested in that piano, he said it was the very best investment that he ever made in his life. So I loved the piano. I started entering competitions when I was nine years old, and I won my first competition, and it was in the 12-year-old division. And it was the first time you could get in, and I won the first year that I, that I um, entered the competition, and I knew that the piano was my thing. Now let me tell you a little bit about my church background. So you would think that me playing these hymns that I played my entire life since I was five years old in a church setting at church, but I didn't. I grew up in an a cappella church. Now if you're in the South and you're in Texas, or I grew up in Reno, Nevada, but you're in Texas, you're in Tennessee, uh, you're in Florida, Alabama, you have heard of the Church of Christ. I grew up in the Church of Christ. It's a wonderful church. They teach you so much about the Bible. I went to church three times a week my whole life, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Bible classes, Sunday morning, sun and Wednesday night. But they do not have instruments in the church service. So my whole life I sat listening to a cappella singing and learning how to sing Soprano, alto, tenor, and bass, in case some of the men didn't show up, you know. <laughs> but I heard, I heard all the parts, and that's how I learned music, sitting in the pew and listening to four-part harmony. I always wondered what it would sound like on the piano growing up, because I never played hymns. My grandparents were really inf influential, and they taught me so much. They taught me hymns, and we'd learn them at home, and we'd sing them, and then i get to play it on the piano. And my grandfather taught me scripture, and he taught me one thing that I've thought about lately a lot, how to speak to people. Now when, he, when we'd go to church, he'd say, now when people come up and they ask you, Lori, how old you are, I don't want you to just say four. I want you to say a complete sentence. I am four years old. And I want you to use your personality, and when you talk to people, I want you to look at them in their eyes. I remember this. So we'd go to church and we'd get there, and I remember I wanted to make my grandparents very happy. And we, he'd say, now, in addition to all that, I want you to go over and talk to Sister Smalley over there, because she had a very bad week this week, and you want to ask her how she's doing. And then I want you to go over and talk to Brother Buffkin over there and ask him how he's feeling, and look in their eyes, and talk to them, and look at their faces. So if your grandparents out there, there's something, there's, there's a good good thing you can do for your grandkids. When I was 16 years old, I was baptized. And it was amazing. I gave my life to Jesus. Now you would think, um, everybody wants to know, did your mom and dad, where'd you get your gift from, Lori? Did your mom and dad play the piano? My mother and dad did not play the piano. In fact, I don't believe I've ever seen my mother sit on the piano bench. Now, my dad plays a little bit, but he doesn't play the piano. I grew up, and I was, there were five kids in my family. And so um, 
We all took piano lessons. And if I'm visiting one of my sisters, or she's visiting one of them, or visiting one of me, and I'm out and about, and people recognize me, they'll, they'll say, oh, hi, Lori, I recognize her, Lori Lyon. Yes, I'm Lori Lyon. I'd like you to meet my sister. This is my sister. She lives in Omaha. You're Lori Lyon's sister? Do you play the piano like your mother plays the piano? I mean, your sister plays the piano? And they'll always say, no, I don't play the piano like my sister plays the piano. Now, they had the same opportunity that I had to play the piano. <laughs> but none of my sisters and my brother, none of them play the piano. I'll be out and about, and I'll have one of my two kids with me. And somebody will recognize me. I'll say, this is my daughter. <gasps> your mother's Lori Lyon. Do you play the piano like your mother plays the piano? Now, they had the same opportunity that I had to play the piano. But neither of my children play. They don't play the piano. Poor Tim. <laughs> we'll be out and about, and everybody, sure enough, will come up and say, oh, your wife's Lori Line. Yes, do you play the piano? Also, like Lori plays the piano? Now, Tim had the same opportunity that I had to play the piano. He took from Sister Mary up in Bismarck, North Dakota, to play, and, but Tim does not play the piano. Anybody who hangs out with me, if you're walking by me, they're going to ask you if they play the piano like me. But I was the first person and the only person to play the piano. Now, I think I probably got my gift from my grandfather, who taught me to look at people in the eyes, in their eyes. And I think I got the gift from my grandmother on my father's side. They were both very musical. My grandmother on my dad's side played the piano. But all I know is none of it ever went to any of those people, and it all came to me, only me, moi. And I'm the only one who plays the piano. I was the first person in my family to get a college degree. And everybody knew that I was getting a degree in piano performance, and they're like, OK, she's the first person. What in the world is she ever going to do with a degree in piano performance? <laughs> it took me 10 years to get my degree. I paid my own way, and I didn't want to take a student loan, so I had always a good job, and I paid my way as I went. While I was going to college, I went to a Christmas dinner with a bunch of friends, and we were sitting around having beautiful food, and uh, as we sat down to eat, one of my friends put a cassette tape in the boom box next to the dining room table, and it was the first time that I heard beautiful piano music being recorded and played. And I, I could barely contain myself. I could barely eat. And I said, who it, people are actually listening to piano music? This is amazing. Who is this? Well, it was George Winston, everybody. Oh. It was George Winston. It was 1982. And the album was called Winter, remember? It was a big hit. And I heard that music, and I said, I can do that. A few years later, I met this tall, handsome, long-legged guy on an airplane. It was Tim. We sat next to each other on the aisle, and if you attend my shows, you know that Tim always tells the love story of how we met, and it was really fun. I was traveling with my mother and my sister that day, and my sister introduced us, and we talked on the way home. He didn't ask me out right away, but we ran into each other later at a gym, at the fitness club. And I walked up to him and I said, because oh, I told everybody I met the guy that I was going to marry. I even told my mother, and she said, yes, he's a perfect fit for you. <laughs> and so I walked up to Tim and I said, hello, Tim. And he says, hi, Mary. <laughs> but he did ask me out on a date, and we went out. And six months later, uh, we got married. When he asked me to marry him, it was a two-part question. He said, will you marry me, and will you move to Minneapolis with me? He had a job transfer. He worked for Jostens, the class ring company. And uh, he said, I think you'll really love living in Minneapolis. He, and he was going to go into the Bloomington office and work in marketing. Minneapolis is a fabulous city. I'd never been to the Midwest before. Grew up in Reno, Nevada. And I said yes to both questions. I said yes. And so we moved to Minneapolis. Before we moved, he took me down to Las Vegas to meet his parents. 
Now, his parents were Lutherans. <laughs> and I have to tell you, this is gonna just crack you up in your mind anyway, it does in my mind. I had never met a Lutheran before I met Tim. <laughs> now, growing up in Nevada, you meet Catholics and Mormons. But I'd never met a Lutheran before. So I got down there, and uh, I met his family, and they were lovely Lutherans, I have to say. They are still Lutherans. And so his mother said, Lori, I hear you play the piano. I do play the piano. I, you, you just got your degree. Yes, I just got my degree. Well, we'd like for you to play at church tomorrow. I said, oh boy, I've never played at church before. She said, you've never played at church? I'm 28 years old, everybody. And she said, well, I think you should try it. And I said, okay. I said, well, what should I play? She said, play whatever you'd like to play. <laughs> so I said, all right, that sounds great. So I went to church with Tim's family, my first time to a Lutheran church, and I played the piano for the very first time in a church setting with his family, and I would like to play for you. I still remember the hymn. I said, I've never played before. I've never played a hymn before. I'll just play, I'll play what I know, my favorite hymn. And so I did, and here's what I played.
to Minneapolis, and uh, we started attending church together, Tim and me, and I started actually playing a little bit of piano in church. We walked across the street uh, toward the first church, and it was at Wooddale Church, and I started playing there, uh, little appearances, and one day after church, we went down to uh, downtown to Dayton's uh, to have lunch, and we walked on the first floor. We were going to go down to the lower level, and there was... Up on the main level, there was a pianist that was playing the piano. And Tim looked over at me and goes, now, that's what you should be doing. Because you would get to do the two things that you love to do most under one roof, shop and play the piano. <laughs> so I auditioned. I had a regular job during the day, and I auditioned, and I got the job. I was one of 17 or 19 pianists that played during that time. And it was a very amazing job for me. I had no friends. When we moved to the Midwest, I didn't know a single person. And so I started to make friends. And it was awesome. But it was humble because I'd gotten my degree and people said, oh, you got a job playing the piano. Yes, I'm a department store pianist. I, and, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I loved it so much. I was so content. Uh, I remember driving home one night thinking, if I never do anything but play the piano at a department store, I'll be happy for the rest of my life. I wanted to be a bright and shining light, and I talked to people when they'd come by, and I made friends, and, and uh, I remember the verse. This is one of my favorite verses, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. On busy days... 30,000 people walked by me a day on those 13-hour sale days. <laughs> 30,000 people a day walked by me, and people would come up to me and say, do you have a cassette tape? You have to think about that. Do you have a cassette tape, Lori? And I'd say, no, I don't, but if I ever do one, I'll, I'll let you know. Let me take your name and your number and your address, and I started writing people's names down. And then Tim, he made me buy a computer I didn't want to buy a computer, but he made me and said, you need a database, Lori. These people all love you, and you should start a list of people. So I did. And when my list grew to be about 500 people, I looked on the back of that winter album of George Winston's, and I called up his engineer in San Francisco. And I said, hi, I'm a department store pianist in Minneapolis. <laughs> I really uh, would like to come out and make an album. Do you still record albums? I know you recorded George Winston's album. Can I come out and record an album with you? Do you do that? I have no idea what I'm doing. I need someone to help me. And he says, well, yes. And I, I still do that. And I said, well, that would be great. How long should I be there? And, and how much money should I bring, you know? <laughs> and so I, was, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. He said, well, it depends on how well you play. I said, well, I'm a department store pianist. I can play <laughs> anything, everything. He says, well, why don't you plan to, uh, to, why don't you plan to st stay, stay about three days and bring about $1,500? I said, OK. So, Tim now, he had this brand new job, but I asked him if I could borrow all the money in his 401k, because it was a brand new job. <laughs> so I took his $1,500, and I booked a hotel, and I flew off to San Francisco, and this guy met me that was George Winston's engineer, and I knew I was in good hands, because we got in the car in the parking lot, and he had a black Ferrari, and <laughs> off we went. I came back home with my master. I made the album and replicated it. My, and it was still just cassette tapes. And I went to the person I worked for, and I asked her, what would you think of if I could sell some cassette tapes while I played the piano? And she said, oh, no. That's not going to happen. OK. Well, then I went to the next person. What would you think? You know that people would like to have a cassette tape. What would you think if I sold cassette tapes while I played the piano? Oh, no. That's not happening. So all my dreams, and I owed Tim $1,500, <laughs> died because everybody said no to me. I thought, well, I'm not talking to the right person. You know, everybody that's saying no to me, they don't have vision. They should, they should definitely do this. And then I told them that Nordstrom was coming to town, you know? <laughs> and Nordstrom had pianists, and Nordstrom had pianists who sold CDs and well, cassette tapes back there, and CDs were starting to come in. So I ended up in the vice president's office at Dayton's. His name is Dennis Toffolo. 
And I sat and I had this little tiny business plan that I gave to him that I thought that I could sell. If I sold X amount, that would be really good, you know. And he was really cute. He said, okay, let's do it. We'll buy the CDs from you. But now we're getting into CDs. We'll buy CDs from you and you can, you can become a pianist and a vendor at the same time. We'll buy them and we'll pay you for them. I said, oh, that is so great. And uh, he said, but just do it quietly, Lori. <laughs> I said, okay. So the first day I got out there and I put 40 cassette tapes on the, on the thing. And they sold, I was in between lingerie and handbags, you know. And so they sold more cassette tapes than they did a, underwear that day, panties that day. They just kept bringing up the cassette tapes and the cassette tapes, and it was a big hit. And I knew, again, I was on to something that was going to be really wonderful and big. The third project that I put together, it was a Christmas album. And I went and I said, what would you think if you went in all the trim the tree shops of Dayton's, Marshall's, and, and Hudson's, and put them in all of them and played when people came in and they could be right on the stand there? And they said, yes, because it was doing so well. So I went from being in just three little stores, Southdale, Rosedale, and downtown, to 67 stores. And everybody walked in, and I was the only cassette tape that was playing the whole Christmas season. I'm sure everybody got tired of it that was listening to it there that worked there, but I wasn't getting tired of it because it sold so well. Well, in five years' time, being a pianist and a vendor was an amazing thing for me at Dayton's. They sold almost a million albums, and uh, we had such a terrific time together. Well, gift, stars, gift stores started carrying me, too. So, you know, when you'd go up to Door County and you'd go in those really cute little stores, there was my little album sitting right there, and they were playing it. Oh, that's that gal at Dayton's. I want to buy that album. So we started doing very, very well in gift stores. And then the Mall of America opened up, and uh, I was right outside of Musicland playing the piano, and I had a new album and a CD called Threads of Love that was out. And everybody was around the piano, and I had this thing going on. It was so much fun. And in walks the CEO of Musicland, Mr. Jack Eukster, who's here tonight, and I recognize you sitting there. And he walks by me, and he goes into his store, because he's the CEO, and he walks up to the counter, and he says, what's the best-selling item of the day today? And they said, we're not carrying her. She's right outside the door. <laughs> Her name is Lori Lyon, and she has this really hot new little album called Threads of Love, and we should carry her. And he says, well, I'll take care of that. Mr. Eukster walked by me, and he set up an appointment to come to my home. <laughs> and I lived over in the Shorewood in a little beautiful home over there, and he came and he visited me, and he believed in me, and he says, I think that you're going to do just terrific, Lori. So he bought them for all of his stores, 300 and something stores that he had in Musicland. And when one, music, one major retailer carries you, they all start to carry you. So Sam Goody came up, Best Buy, Target, um, Barnes & Noble. Um, they were all carrying my music. And it started to be a big thing. So Tim and I were having breakfast at the Pancake House, the original Pancake House in Edina. And I said, you know, we really should tour, Tim. We should do this. It's October. It was October something like 30 years ago. And I said, why don't you quit your job <laughs> and become the tour manager? And he had, Tim Justins had done a lot of transitions. There were all new bosses there. And I could tell that Tim wasn't totally happy doing that. And I had a whole big thing going on. And there was no way I was going to go out and leave Tim at home. So I said, you have to join. Let's go. Be my tour manager. Oh, he says, OK. Next year. I said, next year? you got to come now. Let's go. Spit spot. We're going. Let's go this, this year. we got places to be. He said, all right. So he went in, and he gave his two-week notice, and he quit, and he became the tour manager. And it was a perfect job for Tim. And we've never been apart. We've always been together. We started uh, touring and going out around Minneapolis. We went to um, Grand Forks first, Sioux Falls, Fargo-Moorhead now. Uh, we're doing 32 cities this year. And I, I, get a, I get such pleasure when people don't know really what we do, and they walk up to me and they say, oh, this is Tim, yeah, this is, do you go with Lori, Tim? And I, I, and I say, I always say, no, I go with him. He's in charge. He is the one that uh, makes my life so wonderful and, and so great. Well, 
We never signed with a, a label. We never did anything but it, all of this on our own. We had no business background. Tim had a little business background, but I never took a business course in my whole life. We saw our business grow. We were on the billboard charts three times. We hired a pop chamber orchestra. We had four buses and three semi-trucks at one point. We supported dozens of people in the music business and families in the music business. And we had no business partners, no investors. We financed ourselves. We were probably the largest independent music label in the country. We might still be. And in the beginning, people always said, well, Lori, what label are you under? Because everybody had labels. Wyndham Hill, you know, they're all just big labels. I don't, I don't have a label. I'm all by myself. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> And today, I'll tell you what, if I had had a label, it would have been horrible. It would have been horrible, horrible, horrible. We've been able to do all these things on our own. In the Bible, you think about all the people that took risk. Abraham, Moses, Noah, Joseph, David, the 12 apostles, the apostle Paul, Mary and Joseph. They all took great risks. Tim and I, we've taken so much risk when we did all this. Nobody was, there was nobody to really read a book on how to do it. We just used our gut and, and decided that we would do certain things. And it was going so wonderful until 2008. 2008, anybody remember 2008? <laughs> the Great Recession. All those music stores that we talked about, they closed. And it was like dominoes. They went boop, 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 boop. They all went down. You were retired, Jack. You got out early. That was good. <laughs> and uh, we almost, Tim and I, we almost lost everything that we'd worked for. And we just saw it going down. We just watched it. And here's what was going to happen now in the music business. The music was not going to be sold in stores. You can't go to a store anymore and buy music. It's going to go to streaming now. Streaming. I'd never heard of streaming. I was so far behind on all of this. It was going to go now to streaming. Now, so all those cassette tapes and all those CDs came back to our office. And we're going to now make our money getting played streaming. So how much do you think I would get played, paid for one song getting, go, go, getting played and getting out there in the streaming world? Maybe, what, 15 cents, 10 cents? That'd be, I'd be so rich. <laughs> Streaming went to, if you got played, and the song went all the way through, I get paid the same thing as Taylor Swift. She just says, lots more than me. But every artist gets paid the same. It is. You ready? One one thousandth of a penny. Welcome to the music business. That's what happened to Tim and me. So we started seeking God instead of answers because our whole life changed overnight like that. And you really can't tell people. I remember a pastor walking up to me and saying, what happened to you? <laughs> well, I went from having this really successful business, now I make one one thousandth of a penny if a song gets played. That's what happened to us. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord always, and confidently with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, and always submit to him, and he will direct your paths. John 16, 33, I have told you all of this, so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. Well, to make matters worse... <laughs> If it couldn't get any worse. I'd had this little album called Simply Grand Out. And we needed to get streaming attention. So I, I decided that I would submit my little album, Simply Grand, to the Star Tribune, John Breen. Now, John has never really liked me. I've never been his cup of tea. I just don't have what he likes. But I thought, well, he'll, he'll make mention of this. He'll say some really nice things, because it's a wonderful album. And maybe people will find me and start streaming my album, Simply Grand. So I submitted it to John. And pretty typical, he said a few little nice things about the album. And then the last sentence said, 
but it's a little more simple than it is grand. Ugh. It just killed me. Well, meanwhile, Tim is figuring out streaming, and he says, I'm going to submit it to this little company, Lori. And I know it's only one one-thousandth of a penny, but I'm going to submit this to this little streaming company. And I said, oh, it'll never work. We'll never get paid. We'll never make that happen. No, I'm going to submit it. It's called Pandora. <laughs> I said, all right. Well, I'm here to tell you today that one of my, very, my most successful songs on Pandora, Pandora now is my biggest client. And one of my most successful songs is off the album, Simply Grand. And this is funny. It's called Time to Say Goodbye. I don't think so, right? <laughs> time to Say Goodbye, as of this morning, the spinning on Time to Say Goodbye is 115 million times. My spins now on Pandora are my lifetime spins, as of this morning. 796 million lifetime spins. I hope to live to see a billion lifetime spins on Pandora. So if you know John, tell him I said hi. <laughs> and there is a moral to the story. Sometimes it pays to be simple. Well, COVID hit. <laughs> Just when we got our legs back underneath us, COVID hit, and Governor Walsh shut down all the Minnesota venues six weeks before we were to go out on a tour. Once again, the music business changed and was shut down. We, become, we became insignificant, and here we go again. But this time, we were much more prepared. <laughs> oh, I'd never be caught like I'd been caught before. But for the first time in 25 years, I didn't tour at wintertime. I had toured in the springtime, 22 cities, but I didn't go out during winter. And for the first time, I saw the lake freeze from my window. I saw the ice come and go, and it came to me that I should continue to play. So I decided that I would, for the first time, now everybody else was doing it, but I didn't want to do it, but I thought, I'll do a virtual show. I'm going to put a virtual show together, and a good one. I saw a lot of them, and I didn't want to do it because they didn't look very good. I end up, ended up playing to thousands of people that year in 2020 because I put a a virtual show together, and I put it out there for everybody. It opened up a new thing for me. The West Coast, the East Coast, and all the people that could never go to Christmas now found me virtually. I'd been doing another thing. I'd been doing something called the Living Room Series where I played privately to a few people in my home. We kept going on it, and I invited people. We could remember the restriction. You could only have 10 people at one time at your house. So I invited six to ten people to come and hear me play the piano that year. And many people came. I cooked and I played the piano night after night after night in 2020. So when other musicians weren't working, I was playing my fingers to the bone and cooking and cleaning and doing virtual shows. So when one door closed for me, two more opened up for me. Everybody who walks in has a story. I know what I look at everybody and you have a story on your heart. I have a story in my heart. My stories change all the time. I have a different one today than I had yesterday. But Tim and I continue to grow in our faith. People look at us and they say, oh, they're so perfect. They look so perfect. Not at all. We are not perfect. I heard some, it described the other day as low-grade pain. Everybody has low-grade pain, no matter what your story is. There's just a little pain. Now, I don't take Advil. I take in Jesus. Tim and I pray every morning out loud before we get out of bed. He brings me a cup of coffee, and we pray out loud every day, every morning. Now, ladies, I have to tell you, there are some benefits to this. Because if you're praying out loud with your husband, he hears your agenda for the day. He knows what's on your heart. You can steer things. It is amazing. <laughs> I have to tell you, I, have, I think the Lord blesses me, but it's Tim that also blesses me every day because I've put out what's on my heart every day, and I say it every day. I've learned how to pray. 
And everything in my life, if everything in my life had been perfect, I don't think I would have ever found Jesus. Now, I tell you, I was baptized when I was 16, but it was in the valleys where I really found Jesus. You can't find Jesus on a hilltop. You find Jesus in the valley. What a friend we have in Jesus. Well, today, I'm getting ready to go out, and uh, my, it's my 35th year of touring in a row. 35 years. I don't know anyone who's toured 35 years consecutively. I might be the only per- crazy person to, <laughs> to do that. I'm going solo for the, first, uh, for the fourth year in a row. When I started playing the Living Room series and playing by myself, I really liked being just by myself. And so I'm going for the fourth year all by myself. My tour opens in Phoenix, Arizona. I have 32 cities. I'm coming to 13 Minnesota cities. And of course, if you can't make it, I have a virtual show that you can see. People always ask me, are you going to to retire? The answer is no. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 9, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith henceforth. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me that day, and not to me only, but also to those who have longed for his appearing. I would like to thank all of you for coming tonight, hear my story, and uh, this is a wonderful church, a wonderful community, what you do. I've been so proud to be a part of it. Thank you for following me all these years, for being my friends, for giving me love and kindness, and, uh, and lots of support over the years. I'd like to close by asking you to open up your hymnal in front of you and join me and singing How Great Thou Art. It's hymn number 856.
verse and the last chorus. Please be seated. <laughs> um, we're going to have a chance to ask Lori some questions. You all are going to have a chance, uh, whether you're here in the house or online. Uh, so I've got a couple of announcements. If you, if you have a question you'd like to ask, we have a microphone there and there. If you are at home and you would like to submit a question, you can send it by email to social, S-O-C-I-A-L, at S-P-D-L-C dot org social at spdlc.org. Uh, depending on how many there are, we may not be able to get through all of them, but uh, we'll get through a few. Uh, so a uh, couple uh, announcements. One, uh, if you are interested in learning more about Lori's 30, which one is it? 30, 35th. 35th. 35th yes. uh, tour, there are brochures outside in the narthex. Uh, the lobby. Um, there are also CDs and books available for sale. I have to say they're at a very good price as well. So yes. mm -hmm. um, anyway, look out there after we're done. And she will be at a, at a desk signing things if you would like her to as well. Uh, I do also want to just let you know about the next event in the series. Uh, on November 21st, um, we'll be welcoming a gentleman named Michael Ward. If any of you have heard of C.S. Lewis, um, famous probably mostly for the Narnia Chronicles. Michael Ward is genuinely one of the world's foremost experts about C.S. Lewis. Um, he'll be talking about one of Lewis's important works, The Evolution of Man. Ward teaches in Oxford, uh, which is where Lewis taught most of his life. Uh, he's become a bit of a friend of mine over the years, and I cannot uh, tell you how excited I am that we're able to welcome him in November. So again, um, November 21st, 7 o'clock. Um, let's see. Oh, and if you want to get, if you're not on our email list uh, or, and want to get updates, please subscribe to that. You can do that at the Faith and Life website. And of course, uh, follow us on all the social media things out there as well. Um, Lori talked about how she and Tim were self-funded. This series is also self-funded. We're at this amazing church. I'm privileged to serve at St. Philip Deacon. This series is not a budget item of this church. Uh, from the very beginning, from the very first season all the way through today, it is entirely supported through the generosity of individuals and area corporations. Um, I cannot say thank you enough to those of you who have supported this for 22 years. It's just, it's one of the blessings of my life, honestly, to welcome wonderful people like Lori and to give these amazing talks. So I, you will see the, the list of people who were, again, this year generous. I'm not gonna read them all, and I hope, as always, that we haven't left anyone out. Uh, but I will lift up just the corporate sponsors, Crossroads Financial Group, Cressa, 
uh, Mally Design, Mastercraft Labels, Valuation Group, Productivity Inc., Rapid Packaging, and Bay Creek Dental is a new uh, corporate sponsor this year. I know there are people from, I think, every one of those corporate sponsors, and of course, many of you have also supported this. Um, can I just say again, thank you, and will you join me in thanking everyone who supports this series? Okay, so we're gonna take a few minutes now for questions, um, and uh, Lori, I'm gonna have you come back on the stage uh, and um, come to the mics if you're here, and otherwise, um, I'm gonna see if we have any online questions. Okay, here we have one, yes. Okay. Yes. My name, my name is Carol, and I have kind of a silly question, but um, I need to know, from an airplane, if you're looking at your house, is it the shape of a grand piano, I've heard? No, my house is not in the shape of a grand piano. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let's so I've been lying to many people. What's that All now? these years I've been lying to people about that. I can't understand what she says. <laughs> she said for many years she's been lying to people. Oh, I don't have a piano-shaped house, no. <laughs> that is the funny thing, though, because I have... I have a friend that is a tour guide, and uh, he's a fishing tour guide, and so uh, he... I, he I talked with him and he, I saw him at a restaurant. He says, oh yes, Lori, I love pointing out your house all the time on, on the tours. Wow, I said, uh, well, where, where do you fish then? You must, you fish at Forest Lake Bay? Oh no, I'm out on the main lake, out on, on Wyzetta Bay. And he said, you know, it's that third house from the point at, on, uh, in Wyzetta. I said, I don't live in Wyzetta. <laughs> so he had been telling people, see, this is how rumors get started. He had been telling people for 10 years that Lori Line lived at this house. That's not my house. And I don't live in a piano-shaped house, but I do have a, a beautiful small stage in my home with a, a, a concert grand piano on it. So it's half truth. I have a piano, yes. I do have a piano. I live in a house. <laughs> and, I live, uh, and, I, and I've lived there for 28 years, and we, are, we live on Forest Lake Bay. Anybody else? It's hard for me to hear on that, that mic, so up here anyway. Uh, hello, hello, there we go. Okay. Um, here's, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but I'm gonna ask it. Uh, how many costumes do you have? Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't know that answer. Um, in, the, in the heyday, I did maybe five changes on a show, and they were beautiful costumes. We have a small warehouse uh, next to where we live that I have stored the, the costumes in for years and years and years. And remember that I had a pop chamber orchestra, that there were 12 of them, so I have 12 of everything. <laughs> if any of you need a Halloween costume, come see me. <laughs> I have beautiful costumes, uh, you know, and now it's not, not as ridiculous now. I'm only making two for each uh, concert uh, tour now. I'm working on, I'm on my fifth, first fitting tomorrow morning with one. But they are, uh, Jack, Jack Edwards was the costume designer and he worked at the Guthrie and he worked with me for 15 years. He was fabulous. And uh, he, he, was, he was quite, quite elaborate. And uh, he always tried things on me and I said, well, you know, Jack, that's not maybe quite right for me because I play the piano, you know. And, uh, but we had a lovely time and I have, uh, I mean, you can multiply it out, 20 years, six costumes, and I've uh, gotten rid of a lot of them, but I still have the ones that I love the most, and uh, every once in a while, I'll recycle them and wear them again. Yes? Okay, any other, uh, um, I do have another one from online. Okay. Um, I am a longtime admirer of your enthusiasm for music. Thank you for sharing your God-given talents in piano performances and composition. I am curious, have you been blessed with a chapter of grandparenting yet? No, our, oh, that's a good question. Um, we're still hoping our kids find a girlfriend or a boyfriend. My son, while I was getting ready today, called to tell me that he just broke up with this girlfriend. So they're single. I have, we're still hoping they find someone to marry, you know? <laughs> that, I think we, should got, we got to do it in the right order, you know? Uh, no, I, we are single, and uh, I, you know, God will surprise me with that, won't he? He will surprise me, and I would, would imagine that would be wonderful to be a grandmother, but um, I don't know what that future is going to look like. Okay, I'm, I'm, yes. I'm, oh, could, would you? What do our ch children do? Okay, so we have two adopted children. They have their own DNA. So when they, people would say, do you, do you play the piano like your mom? Absolutely not. They do not. They're amazing kids. They have uh, wonderful jobs. 
Our daughter is 35, and she works for a company called Jamf, which is a software company that packages up Apple products for churches like this. Uh, and uh, she's in sales. She's a senior account manager for Jamf here locally. And our son uh, works for a congressman in Texas. And he's 30, and, uh, he, but he lives in D.C. So he's back and forth to D.C. So I'm hoping he finds a Texas girl, you know. <laughs> that's what I was hoping today. And so that's what they do. And he actually uh, is a political director for a, a guy named August Pfluger, who is a wonderful congressman in Texas. And so he's completely involved in politics. I get to hear all the ins and outs of politics all day long, which is good and bad. <laughs> Anybody oh, okay. else? Do, do we have another one? Are you coming up to the mic? OK, excellent. All right. Obviously, the piano is your instrument. Can you tell us a time when you had an interesting experience with the piano when you're traveling? Oh, well, we take our own concert grand piano. This is not my piano. And, uh, um, so let's see, Tim. OK, I've got a good one. The weather, see, so when you're traveling, uh, you have to put the piano and tip the piano. We tip it around noon. And some, when you're up in Bismarck, North Dakota, and it's traveled in the key, in, in a trailer or a truck, you see the condensation, and it, is, you just, it just has to kind of go away and, and before you can play it. One time, though, we were really rushed, and we went from Fargo to, I think we went to Rapid City, and we didn't have any time for the piano to rest. And so when I got up to play the piano, the, the keys were still frozen. And, uh, and I actually knocked down every key when I played it. I pr pressed it extremely hard, and it took a couple of shows for it to warm up, and that's how, uh, how tight the, the time frame was. And, and the weather is inc pretty, pretty brutal on, an, on a piano when it travels every day like that. But my piano does wonderful in, in the cold weather. That's my piano story. Yes, I'm, we've never dropped it. Tim is the piano mover. We move it every day. It weighs uh, 1,450 pounds. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, we, we, it travels in a case, and we roll it down. It's very protected. It's been on over 2,000 stages. Mm -hmm. All right. This is uh, maybe sort of similar to that question, but it's not specific to the instrument. OK. The question is, uh, what's the funniest thing that has ever happened during a performance? Oh. <laughs> it's always a live show. You know, and so crazy things happen. We were in Detroit Lakes, and um, <laughs> I'm almost embarrassed to tell you this story because it's so painful. But uh, we, when you're backstage, I had an amazing costume. It's all the stories put in one tonight. I had an amazing costume, and it had a train on it that went from here to the end of the stage, and it was beautiful. Well, I steamed my clothes and get them ready to go and everything. I hung my costume on one of those fire deals at the top. Oh. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so Tim comes in, and it's about time to go out and get, put my dress on and go out to the stage. And he says, oh, you've got your dress on the, the fire deal. I said, those things don't work. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, oh, yes, they do. And I said, no, they don't. And I took the thing off, and it goes, and it hit it. And in Detroit Lakes, this is a very old, old building, and all the water started coming out, and it was black. Because, because uh, you know, it's, uh, it's everything. It's never been uh, cleared out. And so it's on my beautiful dress. It's on my hair. It's on my face. It's on Tim. And it is flooding the whole backstage area. The fire alarms are going off. So we shut the door. Tim's shoes, he had beautiful shoes. They're floating. We picked, we picked everything up. We picked the dress up. We could go out. And, I seriously couldn't believe it. I, I was totally drowned. I was totally wet. My dress was wet. Everything was wet. And it was showtime. So I said, what am I going to do? Oh, my goodness. Well, my assistant, who had worked for me many, many years and had done my hair for many years, was out in the crowd. I said, go get Amy Wagner. Go get her right now. Go get her. So she comes backstage. And she goes, Laura, here you are. Oh! She goes, what the world happened to you? I said, well. You know, those fire things, they really do work. <laughs> so she says, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. She said, well, I think I can do something with you. So she piled all my hair up wet on my head. My, my outfit was soaking wet. I put it on. 
I redid my, the black under my eyes. I took it all off. The, the fire department came in. We, we, we got everything under control. I started the show 10 minutes late. I walked out. I was squeaking in my shoes. <laughs> walking out. And I, could, I couldn't lift my dress up because it was so, and nobody knew. Nobody had any idea. I sat down at that piano and I said, well, I'm sorry about the fire alarms. I'm the one who tripped them. And I said, I, my dress is completely wet. I'm complete. I was shaking. I was so cold. Uh, but that's my, uh, my, my biggest story of one of those things that had happened. That one's got to go in a book. All right. I think we're going to do one more. And then again, after, um, after she answers this question, I'm, I'm, just listen up. I'm going to walk up on stage. And then I'm going to give her a gift, and then you can applaud wildly, OK? okay. So don't applaud wildly until I get up there, because otherwise I'll have to have you quiet down first. And it's just awkward, OK? And before I ask the question, by the way, I did fail to thank Jeff Elstad over there, our guitarist. Thank you, Jeff, yeah. for your music. And I do know one person online watching. Uh, her name is Beth, and you're the reason you are, or she's the reason that you are here tonight, Lori. So, Beth, thank you for the suggestion. OK, here's the question. Um, can you, oh, now I got two questions. Um, oh, all right. Um, <laughs> Must be good. OK, I'm going to ask you both. And you can either answer them both, Lori, or choose. Are there any upcoming projects or collaborations you're particularly excited about that align with your faith yes. is one. Uh, and then you talked a little about this in your talk. Can you share a challenging moment in your career and how your faith helped you overcome it? Okay. So my challenging, uh, the, the interesting thing, I told you I never played hymns before in church, and uh, now I make a living playing hymns. <laughs> uh, I have uh, 11 heritage albums. I have 65 music books that I've published. Um, I, my goal in my life is to be the most published pianist in modern day times. I have 850 songs. You have to be wide and deep now to be in the music business. But, but the greatest, my greatest uh, and my proudest music that I've worked on are my hymns because I didn't ever play hymns before. And now I've recorded 11 albums and 11 music, complete music books of hymns. And I think there are a lot of women and a lot of men who uh, play in churches, who play Lori Line music and Lori Line hymns all over the United States. And I think that is probably what I'm proudest about in, uh, in my career. <laughs> they liked the answer, Tim. <laughs> Did you want to say more? Were, no, I said they liked the answer. Oh, I know. <laughs> But now I have to be, tell them to shush. All right. Um, thank you all for coming out. Uh, what a wonderful, wonderful evening. I'm glad each of you could be here. To those of you who joined us uh, digitally, I'm grateful for your presence as always. Uh, Tim, a pleasure to meet you in person. Lori, it's been a oh, joy to work you, with you. We have a little gift for you to thank you for being with us. As a remembrance, it's a bit of granite. It's quite heavy, actually. Not as heavy as a piano. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, with thanks to Lori Lyon for bringing faith to life. Oh, and we do thank, thank you, you very much I indeed. I will put that on a wall in a very special place. Lovely. Thank you thank so you. much. And now. Yeah.